you hear the words from your doctor, it's cancer, and there's not much more that, that we can do. And so you begin to make the funeral preparations with your family, and you pray, and you pray, and, and you hope beyond all hope that something is going to change, but, but it just doesn't. But, but you've heard the stories, stories like uh, the one of 56-year-old Greg Thomas who lives in rural Minnesota. Greg had been experiencing these searing headaches and jaw aches and ear aches. Come to find out it was inoperable head and neck cancer. And the cancer had progressed so far that the doctors advised the family start making funeral preparations. And Greg prayed as, as we would. And he underwent the chemotherapy and the radiation treatments and nothing good was happening. And then all of a sudden, the tumors started to shrink all on their own. And four years after his diagnosis, the doctors removed the feeding tube, which they said would be in Greg for the rest of his life. And today he is in full remission. But Greg's miracle is not everyone's miracle, is it? And we wonder why. Even though we hope and we pray and we, we pray some more and we don't see any tangible evidence that God is doing anything to act on our behalf or to change the situation. And we begin to have our doubts about God's power to act in our lives. Have you been there? Maybe you're there right now. Maybe like Job, you've had all this garbage compiling into your life. Maybe all at once, maybe just little bits at a time. And maybe you wonder, do I have the perseverance of Job to wait for God to act? My friends, you're not alone. Christians struggle with this. John the Baptist struggled with this. Are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Why would John the Baptist even begin to think to ask this question of Jesus? Remember, John was the one who had been miraculously conceived by his aged parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. That wasn't supposed to happen, but it did. John was the one about whom the scriptures had foretold. There was a 400-year-old prophecy about John the Baptist, and then it happened. God appeared to John and told him, go out into the wilderness and preach to the people repentance. Go to the Jordan River and baptize the people for the forgiveness of their sins. Prepare the hearts of these people because the Messiah is coming and that's your job. John was the one who baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. He saw the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus in the form of a dove. He, heard the, or he saw the heavens open and he heard God the Father speak from heaven speaking approval that this man was the Son of God. And John had pointed to him, pointed his people and his disciples to that man and said, look, there's the Lamb of God who is taking away the sins of the world. That's John's life. And now, now in our story this morning, John is in a dungeon and he's been there for months because what had happened was the ruler of his area, Herod Antipas, he had divorced his wife in order to go and marry his brother's wife. And John said, you can't do that. God says, that's a no-no. And Herod didn't like that. And so he had John arrested and put in this dungeon. And so here John sits. He's not able to fulfill his mission. He's not able to do what God called him to do. And so he's asking the question, have I hitched my cart to the right horse? Have I pointed my people and my disciples to the right Messiah? Have I put my faith in the right Savior? Jesus, if you are who you say you are, then, then where's my miracle? Do you wonder, while you wait for God to, ask, uh, to act in your life, are, are you somewhat perplexed by God's wisdom and his timing, wondering 
Are you going to do something about this? Why don't you do something about this? Like Job, uh, you've had your disasters in your life, I know. You still struggle with grief over a loved one who has died and, and you pray to God about it and you say, Lord, I, I thought this was going to be much easier. Where's my miracle? You suffer with pain from this disease that just racks your body and, and you say to God, you know, if, if you just lifted this from me, I would be able to do so much more for you. Where's my miracle? You watch a loved one suffer physical or psychological, or suffer from physical or psychological demons, and and you pray for them, and you sort of say, Lord, where's their miracle? Or maybe there's that that project that you have due at work or at school, (laughs) that competition that you participated in, and you had prayed to God about that specific thing, and the results were not what you expected, and you say, Lord, where was my... Where was my miracle? And so what you do is you go back to the scriptures and you try to read them at home by yourself and, and you just get frustrated because you just, you just don't understand it. You don't get it. And so you set it back on the shelf or on the coffee table where it gathers dust. You just abandon it all together and you abandon prayer to God and you begin to look to other places, other places, people for answers. Where's my miracle? Are you frustrated with God? Are you angry with Him? Are you asking Him this holiday season, where's my Christmas miracle? These are the same types of questions that John the Baptist asked. He didn't see any evidence that God was going to act for him and so he wondered and he doubted. But, But John extended a lifeline. John extended a lifeline and sent two disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? And Jesus sends the two disciples back to the dungeon with this report. You go tell John what you're seeing and what you're hearing. The blind are seeing. The lame are walking. Those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf are hearing. The dead are raised. And the good news is being preached to the poor. The two disciples now were John's eyes and his ears. And now John, after hearing that message, could see clearly through those prison bars. Because what Jesus did was he pointed him back to the scriptures. When Jesus listed all of those things that he was doing, that was almost a word-for-word quote from the prophet Isaiah, who lived 700 years before Jesus and had predicted exactly what the Messiah was going to do. John could see clearly. Yes, I have hitched my cart to the right horse. I have put my faith in the right Messiah. He is doing what he said he would do. And then Jesus sends a blessing along with his messenger, sends a blessing for that prisoner. And he says, Blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me. John was blessed. He was happy because he still clung in faith to Jesus as his Savior to rescue him. And John says, blessed are you, John, because you have not fallen away, but don't, don't trip and fall, don't stumble and fall if you don't understand God's timing in all of this. Don't be offended if you do not understand God's wisdom in all of this. And God, in his wisdom, allowed John to linger in that dungeon, and eventually the executioner's sword fell on John's neck. But Herod's sword could not sever from John what Jesus had given him. And that was the gift of eternal life in heaven. So you may be still asking, but but where's my miracle? When will God act for me? My brothers and sisters, he already has. Just think about Jesus This is God from eternity. He existed before the creation of the world and and he had a hand in creating the world. But then 2,000 years ago, God in his divine wisdom decided that he was going to send his son in human flesh to be conceived in the womb of a virgin. That's a miracle. 
and then to be birthed, and then to have to grow in wisdom and stature among people. God having to increase his knowledge and understanding of scriptures? Yes. God in flesh. And God in flesh walked this earth. He walked the streets and the highways of Palestine, healing the sick, raising the dead. That's a miracle. And preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. But the miracle is that Jesus did this perfectly. He did this flawlessly. He did this with complete righteousness and holiness, something that you and I cannot do. There's your miracle. Where's your miracle? Well, on this earth, Jesus took his disciples to this upper room and he took this bread and he broke and he says, this is my body for the forgiveness of your sins. And he took a cup of wine and he gave it to him and said, this is my blood of a new covenant, a new promise that my blood shed for you is given to you every time you do this for the forgiveness of your sins, for the strengthening of your faith in my promises. Your miracles that every time you approach this altar to receive that bread and wine, that Christ's body and blood is there with the bread and the wine, and that every time you receive that, God strengthens your faith and actually forgives your sins and gives you the gift of eternal life in heaven. There's your miracle. Where's your miracle? That Jesus, God and man, divinely omnipotent, allows sinful human beings to take those hands that had carved out the depths of the ocean and formed the heights of the mountains. He allowed those sinful men to bind his hands together and lead him away to trial. He allowed those sinful hands to punch him and slap him in the face and to point accusing fingers in his face. He allowed sinful men to tie his hands to a whipping post. He allowed sinful men to stretch out his arms and to take spikes and drive them through his hands until he was pinned to a cross. And there on the cross, Jesus suffers what's an equivalent to an eternity in hell. There he suffers the wrath of God for sinners who doubt him, who question him, who are frustrated and angry with him. There Jesus suffers for, for those people. That's you and me. And the miracle is this. God forgives you for being angry with him. God forgives you for being frustrated with him. God forgives you for the times that you have pointed your finger and shaken your fist in the face of God. God forgives you for that because Jesus died for you. Where's your miracle? Your miracle is that God in flesh dies on the cross and is buried lifeless in the tomb and then three days later, resurrects his body, makes it come back to life again, and walks on this earth with his body 40 more days. And the miracle is that Jesus promises that because he lives, he's going to take your body from its grave, put it back together again, and make it new so that it will live in heaven forever with him. There's your miracle. Where's your miracle? that after Jesus walked on this earth for 40 days, after his resurrection, he ascended into heaven so that he could make good on a promise. Surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the ages. Jesus is with you all the time, not just now because you're in church, but when you go home and when you go to school and when you go to work, and yes, even when you're in the hospital, Jesus is with you always. That's your miracle. And your miracle is that Jesus took simple water and used it to create faith in your heart so that you would believe all of this. Your miracle is that through the word of God, when you hear it here in church, when you read it and meditate on it for yourself in your home, God promises that he will preserve you in that faith and trust in his promises. And God promises that when you are faithful with receiving his body and blood, faithful in receiving his word, faithful in remembering what he's done for you in your baptism, that he will increase your understanding, that he will increase your faith and trust in his promises. There is your miracle. And my friends, we may not see God's plan clearly. 
when there's certain situations in your life, you may not see a way out. And you may not see your own personal miracle. But the fact is that God never promises to hand you the playbook for his infinite plans for you or for the life of anybody else. He never promises that. Like John the Baptist, how could God allow him to just sit there and to suffer that way and have his life end that way? Why would God do that? I don't know. And why would God allow Satan to do all of those awful things to Job? I don't know. But what I do know is what God did for those two men and their families. In the end, John the Baptist went to heaven. That's a good thing. In the end, Job's health was restored. In the end, he received uh, the blessing of more children. He received twice as much as he had before. But God did the same thing for both of those men. He kept his promise to them to persevere them, to keep them patient and to keep their eyes focused on their Savior. And with you, with all of the things that you have going on in your life, I don't know what God's plan is for that. And one day you will understand all of this. One day you'll get it and you'll go, oh yeah, that's why God allowed that to happen. One day all of the pain and the suffering and the grief and the questions, all of that's going to go away. But not until we join John the Baptist and Job in heaven. But until then, we're going to keep asking the question of Jesus, where's my miracle? And when you do ask that question of Jesus, allow him to take you back to his scriptures. Allow him to point you back to what he has done for you already. And allow him to point you to what he is going to do for you. No matter what your circumstances are today, or tomorrow, or the next day. Wait patiently for him and persevere. And God will act in his way and in his time and according to his will, but always for your benefit. Amen.